Welcome. I'm James Swartout. I'm the Director of National Security Policy for MITRE Center for Data-Driven Policy. The center was created to bring data-driven insights to stakeholders who operate in the public policy space. And as the center nears its one-year anniversary, I really want to thank you on behalf of the team for tuning into this timely discussion on Long Range Strike. And with that, I'll turn it over to the panel's moderator, Paul Benfield. Great, thanks, James. Uh, appreciate everybody for joining today. Uh, appreciate the, the team at MITRE for putting this together and the team at Jane's for uh, helping us out. Uh, as James said, the topic today is, is long range fires. Um, and kind of as a scene setter, I just wanna highlight the fact that Russia as a longtime violator of the INF and China as not a signatory to the INF, both have multiple rocket and missile systems with ranges well over 500 kilometers, which the United States has been slow to, to catch up with. In March of this year, the former Indo-PACOM commander, uh, Admiral Davidson, in a congressional testimony, stressed the need for the Department of Defense to have uh, precision strike fires featuring increased quantities of ground-based missiles and improved air and long-range naval fires capable of ranges over 500 kilometers. And as the MITRE folks know very well, uh, numerous exercises in war games have demonstrated the capability requirements for ground-based long-range precision fires for the joint force, both in the Indo-Pacific and in, in the European theater. This year, the FY22 budget request from the Department of Defense requested $6.6 billion for multi-service, multi-domain offensive long-range fires. So the question for the panel today, um, which I know they're all well-versed in, is are these priorities correct? Are the efforts enough? And where should the department focus on this important modernization priority? When we talk about long-range fires, it is hypersonics, whether it's tactical boost glide, uh, air breathing hypersonics, it is also surface to surface. So extended range cannon artillery from the army, precision strike missiles, the strategic long range cannon. The Navy is also looking at extending the range of Tomahawk cruise missiles and the Navy's standard missile SM6. So with that, I'm going to introduce the panel uh, I'm going to turn it over to them for some initial opening comments. We're going to do a couple minutes of moderated Q&A, and then I would ask the, the audience, if you do have questions, please use the chat function and, and submit your questions, and we'll be uh, happy to get to those after the opening comments. So Hamilton Cook from, from Jane's Defense, Greg Grant from MITRE, and Mark Seep from MITRE. I will now turn it over to Hamilton for some initial comments. Hamilton. Thanks, Paul. I think my thoughts on the matter of this. Right now, when we talk about long range fires, we talk about them as strategic fires, but we're not planning for them strategically nor talking about them tactically. Right now, we talk about hypersonics in the same way we talked about the bomber gap in 1955. We know our greatest rivals have them. We, they might be better than ours. They're building many, many more. Their appearance has caught us off guard, and it's a great talking point for politicians, the services, and industry. But in terms of what we do actually know, all we really know at this point is that we need hypersonics and we need to start building them now. The FY22 budget put aside $3.8 billion for the development and construction of hypersonic weapons. And that number is gonna grow as we see long range hypersonic weapon, arrow, and conventional prop strike move into the later stages of development and production. Yet, in many ways, that's just a best guess because for as many of these panels and articles that we all attend and read, there are many basic questions that we haven't really seen discussions about. Things like, what other than other hypersonic weapons are there going to be the priority targets and what aren't? How are these uh, weapons going to be affecting these targets? Uh, explosively, kinetic effects, things like that. And what, which one of those effectors need to be prioritized to defeat those priority targets? Do the services need to shape their individual offerings around those target sets? Then you end up with complicated interdepartmental questions like what are the nuclear arms control implications of a submarine launched hypersonic weapon? 
And that's before you even really get into the complex engineering challenges of how these all work. And without having these discussions on around a lot of these issues, both large and small, we end up chasing the perfect 50 caliber silver bullet that we think can do everything. Because we don't know quite know what we're prioritizing, we don't know what we're willing to trade off against in order to get it. Is it range, stopping power, cost, timeline, production capacity? And figuring out what we're willing to trade off is going to be important because we're entering a budget era in which we're going to have to trade off more than we would like. In all likelihood, the next decade is going to be marked by fairly flat investment budgets. They could range from the optimistic 3% that we saw in the last fit up to some of what we've forecasted internally scenarios where we see a substantial budget fight in 23 or 24 without the stabilizing effect of the Budget Control Act and investment spending doesn't really recover to current levels till 27 or 28. And that's before you account for things like the debt, potential tax changes, stimulus packages, or even inflation. And that's a big deal because the infusion of the development and procurement spending we've seen over the last few years is starting to get squeezed out by personnel and O&M costs already. Those are growing at twice the rate of the overall budget in total. And that's going to force a lot of pain on the services when they're budgeting because a lot of the money that we saw pushed into the services over the last few years went to buying out uh, legacy system production lines and replenishing war stocks and so now when we're coming off of that and trying to move to next stages of development and fielding next generation technologies those aren't going to be facing returns to just historic production levels but even potential accelerated early sunset to clear cap space so we can fund those emerging priorities. And that's going to be painful for industry and make these budget fights all the tougher. Because in all this pressurized budget environment, we need to know actually how important hypersonics is going to be to our con ops so we can make those trade-offs and know. Because the services are gonna to have to trade them off against something. Is it going to be scaling back nuclear recapitalization that's already going to sustain large tracts of shipbuilding, aircraft, and missile budgets? Is it slowing the long-delayed replacement of ground vehicles and helicopters that are legacy from post-Vietnam recapitalization? Is it limiting S&T spending for next-generation technologies and materials at a time when hypersonics is itself proving how much time it takes to develop and also uh, field an industrial base capable of fielding those at scale. However, the biggest trade-off in terms of hypersonics that we're making is the one that I've been demonstrating for the last four minutes. Making hypersonics be the end-all be-all of long-range strikes and pushing out the development of new non-hypersonic weapons. Right now, as it is absurd to say, the services might be over-prioritizing hypersonic weapons due to the significant technological barriers needed to be conquered in order to develop a day one strike weapon and maybe under investing in the day two plus weapons that will be cheaper, easier to deploy and faster to replenish. This in turn gets heightened because the few investments that we have made for day two plus and strike has been reactionary to maintain the status quo, maintaining standoff, utilizing new launch platforms in the same way, anti-jam GPS and data links to get around jamming and seeker updates to take on new targets, rather than looking at game-breaking attacks that we, that are really why we're so prizing hypersonics, speed, payloads, or even odd delivery systems that change fundamentally how we fight. Because what ended up fielding the bomber gap wasn't us closing it. It was a rising tide of innovations that meant not every bomber had to get could get through but, and on top of that, we had other options so that they didn't have to. I know I could go on, but this is a pair of subject I know Greg holds quite dear, so I'm happy to turn it over to him. Thanks, Hamilton. Let me pick up on an important point uh, Hamilton made, uh, the distraction of this shiny object in the form of hypersonics, which can result, as you mentioned, in underinvesting in cheaper, easier to deploy, and faster to replenish weapons. This was not an entirely unpredictable outcome. Back in 2015 and 2016, when I was still in OSD, there was a lot of pressure coming from the White House, uh, OSTP and OMB to increase funding for hypersonic weapon development. The concern back then though, uh, among many of us in uh, OSD was that it would divert funding away from munitions 
in real need towards the shiny object. Sure enough, soon hypersonics became the end all. The DOD's director of R&E under the previous administration declared hypersonics as number one priority. This was a far cry from what we advocated for in the halcyon days of the third offset strategy, that is payloads over platforms and many low cost effectors. For example, at the time we were looking at quick strike mines and how to increase their range and build in big numbers or building a powered JDAM with an anti-ship sensor, some way to respond to PACOM pleading for a cheap standoff anti-ship capability. Well, somehow we went from emphasizing small, smart, many low cost payloads to few, exquisite, and exceedingly costly. And while I believe hypersonics have utility, some of the arguments made by advocates are a little shaky. Primarily because other countries are building hypersonics, we must. I'm not sure that why this is strictly relevant since we won't put our hypersonics directly against theirs in a hypersonics off. We either need, can build, and can field the capability in a specific time frame, or we don't. Moreover, hypersonics, as Hamilton mentioned, raises some serious questions that I don't think have been uh, adequately answered. For one, they will be considered theater assets, which means release authority will go up the chain. How prompt will their strike really be in this case? Can we really get after fleeting targets with hypersonics? And our targeting situation is very different than, say, China's. And how does the U.S. military win a fight against a nuclear-armed adversary and car carry out large strikes against their homeland? How many strikes can the joint force carry out inside Russia before running into an escalation problem? I think these, these questions need to be asked and answered before we go down this path too far. And in the meantime, we still haven't addressed the munitions crisis. And let me tell you, the preferred munitions picture is all sorts of ugly. Paul mentioned the current spend, but DOD is beginning in a very deep hole dug over many, many years. Because DOD's munitions accounts have long served as convenient bill payers in internal budget battles. The number of weapons we have is far more limited than most people understand, and particularly of weapons we can actually get to the target. This bodes, bodes very ill for any potential high-end co conflict because it, history teaches us wartime munitions expenditure rates far exceed those of peacetime estimates. During recent counter ISO operations, we were dropping so many bombs that DOD was running short of JDAMs and SDBs had to get CENTCOM to adjust its aircraft loadout and use more paveways. Up-to-date war games or recent war games show that in a high-end conflict, preferred weapons expenditures are exceedingly high, leading everyone to kind of throw up their hands on days four and five of a conflict and say, now what do we do? We're headed for a situation where we could have ships steaming around with empty VLS cells while an adversary is still able to generate missile salvos. I believe it's well past time we have a forthright conversation about the dismal state of our munitions stockpiles. And it's not just not a numbers crisis, as Hamilton noted. Rather than focusing resources on an increasing weapon speed, should focus more effort and resources on reducing survivability issues for preferred munitions. That means building in a greater ability to self-coordinate engagements through machine-to-machine -machine teaming, autonomously, sh autonomously sharing target ID, conducting target weapon pairing and coordinated attacks. Now, DOD is trying to ramp up industry, but it's not buying in sufficient quantity for industry to really increase their production lines. Because of the high cost and low quantity of missiles procured, it's difficult to maintain consistent and steady demand. The problem is we lack manufacturing capacity. Today, two out of a total, a five total, of prime contractors account for roughly 97% of DOD's missile procurement funding. There are only two domestic suppliers of solid rocket motors for DOD missiles. And the increased demand for hypersonic weapons will place even more demands on a shrinking munitions industrial base, all of which is not a recipe for success. Now contrast this with China that created an entire branch dedicated to munitions, the PLA rocket force, and focuses ex on extraordinarily fast production, as well as constant upgrades to their advanced munitions inventory. When compared to Chinese munitions production, U.S. stockpiles and production capacity paint a picture even more grim than the widely discussed Navy shipbuilding crisis. Yet there is very little impetus by either DOD or Congress to make big changes. You know, one example in the NDAA, the, the Haas just plussed up missile to the defense to the tune of 780 million, but there were no big ads for munitions. So welcome to the mature, mature precision guided munitions regime 
where DOD finds itself having to scramble to develop new longer range strike systems, yet is constrained in terms of output because of limited manufacturing capacity. We are witnessing the emergence of an era of missile warfare, Marine Corps Commandant Berger recently said. And he acknowledged that the operational challenges posed by the mature precision strike regime will require sweeping changes to force structure, capabilities, and concepts. No question it will, as some have been saying for some time now. I was recently rereading re a paper by Professor Tom Mankin, dating from 2011, titled The Growth and Spread of the Precision Strike Regime. He cites an interesting survey in that paper of US officers attending professional military education institutions from the year 2000, where 9% of officers believe that future adversaries would be unable to use long, or, or only, I'm sorry, only 9% of officers believe that future adversaries would be able to use long range precision strike weapons such as ballistic and cruise missiles to destroy fixed military infrastructure such as, such as ports and airports. Only 12% believe that they would be able to use such weapons to target carriers at sea. Yet both China and Russia observed US operations in Desert Storm in 91 and recognized that guided munitions or battle network warfare was emerging as the dominant war fighting paradigm. And as our great power rivals built up their ability to wage theater level precision guided munitions warfare, DOD moved in the opposite direction. Because permissive environments were assumed and the air defense systems of lightweight regional powers were not considered a major threat. Thus, long-range precision munitions defeat, to defeat advanced adversary threat systems were not a priority. China, in particular, embraced what some have termed a projectile-centric strategy based around long-range ballistic and cruise missiles, as opposed to the airborne platform-based means of U.S. long-range strike. So now our great power rivals have guided munitions parity, and that's something we've never faced before. So in the interest of getting to questions of discussion, let me just touch on one important implication of that parity. In terms of a China scenario, advocates of a, de of a de denial strategy contend that the only way to prevent China's fatal complete strategy is to build up the US military's forward defenses in the Western Pacific, referred to in the national defense strategy as the blunt layer. Unless US forces are in theater, they argue, prior to the outbreak of hostilities and ready to immediately engage a PLA assault, Forces coming from the United States and other theaters will not have the time openings in advantage to prevent such a fatal complaint. Yet there is a real cost to maintaining combat credible forces forward deployed in a mature precision strike regime that comes in the form of diminished offensive strike capability because they require so much capacity and capability devoted to ensuring their own survival. The problem is that forward based US forces and infrastructure must be sufficiently robust to withstand initial attacks by enemy missile sets. And the more force structure deployed forward inside adversary precision missile rings, the more basing and support infrastructure required for support and sustainment, which then translates into a requirement for more missile defense for survivability. In similar fashion to remain combat credible forward deployed naval platforms must increase their defensive armament, which comes at the expense of offensive strike weapons as their magazine capacity is limited. This ultimately will lead to a point of diminishing returns where the force dedicates such significant amounts and quantities of its combat power to ensure its own survival that it begins to lose offensive utility. Yet to provide a credible, credible deterrent, the joint force must be able to operate inside an adversary's weapons engagement zone, the dreaded webs. The DOD is on the wrong end of the cost competition in this area and must find ways to flip the cost equation, including ways to compel adversaries to empty their missile magazines with no effect, as missiles are, as we know, one-shot weapons, and missile magazines are not inexhaustible. This approach won't entail only kinetic solutions. In fact, kinetic solutions are usually cost prohibitive. We're promising as some combination of active and passive countermeasures, including dispersal, deception, concealment, and spoofing. There are also relatively inexpensive approaches, such as hardening, such as hardening aircraft shelters, which would force adversaries to use unitary rounds instead of cluster or air burst munitions. Many of these same operational challenges were manifest during the Cold War and over concentration of infrastructure and a lack of hardening were frequently cited as NATO weaknesses during the 1970s and 1980s. In expectation of heavy strikes against air bases by the Soviets, NATO began to widely disperse aircraft to many different airstrips, airstrips and harden shelters instead of air raid, rain them in straight lines on taxiways. <laughs> 
Dispersal greatly complicates adversary targeting at the tactical and operational level. Wargaming analysis, however, is essential to ensure that the joint forces disperse to a degree that offer offers operational advantage that imposes costs on China, but not to such a degree that it impedes its ability to mass combat power. I'm not sure we fully understand the logistics and manpower challenges associated with dynamic phase. The key is to be resilient and be able to fight through enemy attacks and continue landing punches to keep the adversary off balance. And given industrial based concerns, it will be important and absolutely vital to avoid suffering major attrition early in a protracted war. Let me stop there and turn it to Mark's site. All right, thanks, Greg, for the introduction and to my colleague Hamilton as well. Um, I am going to completely pile on to some of the questions Hamilton raised, um, as well as tee off of something that Greg kind of teed on. Even as Greg and Hamilton are talking about some of the actual weapon systems, whether it's hypersonics or other long range, the other whole angle to this long range strike and precision regime that Greg alluded to is how do you how do you find the targets and then how do you drive the missile in this case that since we're talking mostly about missiles and kinetic systems to the target in question. Uh, Vice Chairman Hyten, during a conversation about hypersonic set, and I quote, he wanted weapons that would enable responsive long range strike options against distant, defended, and or time critical threats, such as road mobile missiles, when other forces are unavailable, denied access, or not preferred. For those of you who have any uh, background or history in the first Gulf War, the Scud missile hunting, um, or for those of us who served maybe during Operation uh, Northern or Southern Watch, and of course, uh, in follow on actions in Iraq, you know that under even under the best of circumstances, finding uh, TELS, you know, the transporter erector launcher systems and or mobile SAMs is difficult at best when you have a permissive sensing environment uh, for lack of something better to, to say. So that when you start looking at Vice Chairman Hyten's requirement and you start looking at some of these systems, um, the ability to execute the kill chain um, in an effective manner um, and to support it really becomes a question mark that I have yet to see through some of the conversation that Hamilton's alluded to and certainly some of the requirements that Greg's laid out, I have yet to see um, in a coherent manner. And yes, for my JADC2 friends out there, I'm gonna hit on JADC2, so you need not worry. We're gonna talk about that in a second. When you start looking at time of flights of some of these weapon systems, as a, as a reminder, and to be clear, I'm not a math major, so public math is very difficult for me. So I wrote this down. A Mach 5 hypersonic missile at max range for the what the Army is declaring is about 1,700 miles. It's still a 30-minute time of flight. And for, again, any of you who um, may not be familiar with how mobile tells and mobile SAMs doctrine work, um, the types of competitors we're going to go up against definitely can set up, shoot, and shut down in 30 minutes. And so how you think you're going to get a missile to go max range of flight uh, and get it to where it needs to be to include um, the initial queuing source, maybe some kind of mid course guidance update, and then finally a terminal guidance really becomes a key requirement that, again, as these systems get developed and as Hamilton laid out in, in great de um, in, in very positive details um, for the six point six billion dollar investment. Uh, again, something that seems to be, if not elusive, um, definitely buried somewhere that becomes difficult to track. There are some things that are happening when you look at some of the queuing sources. So the Army actually has been probably the more forthright of the services um, as far as some of the developments in sensing capabilities. They just bought their first jet, you know, commercial jet uh, um, platform in Artemis uh, with a, a package inside it um, known as Hades, uh, for those of you who uh, nerd out on those kind of things in the Army. Um, I'm going to have some, I was a former wide-bodied aircraft guy uh, in my previous life, so I'm happy to talk about why wide-body aircraft in a WES, as Greg alluded to, may not exactly be the best option for a sensing, certainly at the mid-course or terminal guidance. We can talk about that. For the joint, um, sure. So we're going to talk about JADC2 if you want. Um, but the challenge here is that um, while JADC2, of course, is nominal in nature, of course, the services do obviously are going in their own direction, conversions, overmatch, ABMS, and things of that nature. And what's specific to the long range strike mission set, if you will, is that as you start looking at ways to compete against a peer like a China or a Russia, the idea that a service is gonna be able to go its own way all the way from you know, missile shot through mid course through terminal guidance, um, I, I think is definitely open for question as the battlefield just expands in, in scope and in density. And so the ability to have joint integration um, between the sensor and the weapon being employed 
I think in long range fires is just that much more critical. And unfortunately, with the way JADC2 tends to be going, and for those of you who have seen um, the outgoing and maybe back incoming uh, Air Force Chief uh, Software Officer's uh, LinkedIn comments of the last week, um, who he was on the ground in JADC2. Um, and for those of us who have played with JADC2 in our previous lives, again, question mark that, you know, during the Q&A, Paul, I'm happy to, to tee up and, and pontificate on if you'd like. Finally, when you start looking at the terminal phase in particular, you know, we're not going up against a relatively permissive environment that we have seen the past 20 plus years uh, for those of us who've operated in the Middle East or have been watching that area. What instead you're going to see is a very dense, very contested information environment. This is no secret that both Russia and China are developing systems expressly designed to shut down our information advantage that we've enjoyed over these last 20 years. And so when you start looking at a terminal guidance from a missile that was shot 1700 miles behind you, how that missile discriminates in a way that either through maybe machine learning algorithms inside the seeker head, maybe some kind of tie in to a, a you know, LEO stationed overhead satellite, um, again, assuming that satellite's a viable option and not jammed or worse, um, is a question mark that I don't know has been answered. And more and importantly to that, I think Greg kind of alluded to this in his comments, and I think Hamilton would agree as well, is that it, are these missile systems and are the commanders that are going to own them take the risk, especially, I mean, hypersonics, I mean, Hamilton can quote the numbers better than I can, but the per cost missile, I think, is upwards of you know dozens of millions. And so are they going to be authorized to take the risk to employ those weapons and accept some of the uncertainty that might be in place if in the terminal phase of engagement, these missiles are effectively autonomous and acting on their own, because that's the only way they can accomplish their mission since comms are likely going to be jammed back to what would other be a human control in the loop. There have been a couple, uh, there have been a couple demos in the last couple of years that have been kind of interesting. Um, some of them more virtual slash on paper, if you will, but definitely pointing in the right direction. Um, and to be fair, definitely in a joint flavor. So the one that stands out is uh, Valiant Shield, um, Indo-PACOM's um, uh, annual exercise. Um, one last year basically took a virtual Aegis, so a surface-based, I'm sorry, a maritime surface-based radar, took data from a virtual client of an Aegis radar, uh, plugged it into the uh, Pacific Air Force's operations center in Hawaii, then pushed targeting data forward to an Army uh, HIMARS um, counter ship uh, battery in Guam to make sure that that connectivity was available um, and, and to success. So awesome. Again, questions of how do you then scale that up um, and how do you do that in a contested environment versus a, a, an unfettered information environment? So something we can talk about. And finally, there have been some fine, um, tech demos of very recent nature, like within the last six months that have also been interesting. Uh, one was the Navy shot, um, as Paul alluded to, the Navy's trying to make their standard missile um, SM-6 more viable for long range fires. And they shot it off the back of a unmanned surface vehicle uh, known as Ranger. Um, so pretty cool and uh, definitely something that people like Greg and Hamilton and I have kind of looked at in our current and previous lives about how do you employ systems inside the WES and take greater risk as a commander, knowing that that's what's going to need to happen to prosecute the war. Uh, and then finally, um, just in the last couple months, Air Force had a JASM on a pallet in the back of a EC-130J, rolled that bad boy out, sent some targeting data updates to it in flight, uh, and then basically rerouted the missile as a demo proving that again, there's some mid course for that particular system. But again, some early points in the right direction, but as a command and control guy and watcher, um, still a lot of question marks to be asked. So I look forward to the discussion. Paul, I'll hand it back to you to start the Q&A. Great. Thanks, Mark, I appreciate it. Um, the first question I have for the, the group, and I think I'm gonna turn this over to Hamilton first, and then everybody else can chime in, but you mentioned the difficult budget trade-offs with modernization priorities. Um, so earlier this year, the uh, the commander of Air Force Global Strike Command said that uh, the Army's investment in long-range fires was, quote, stupid. Um, hard to be more blunt than that. But there's, there's a lot behind that comment. You know, there's a very limited pool of resources for the Defense Department. I guess the question is, where do you stand on the on you know the opportunity costs of the army pursuing this is it truly redundant 
is there room for multiple services to be chasing these same lines of effort? So I think first and foremost, we have to take those comments as a represent uh, as what they are, which is a traditional service fight for resources and prestige. This, a lot of this comes from the lack of definition around what role these weapons will play and what we need them to play. There's not a Key West agreement or Johnson McConnell agreement that divides up who gets what in all of this. As a result, the services are going to default for not planning for these joint as joint operations, but presenting them as plans that they can win the war themselves because that's their default operation. Now, on the actual substance of the question, no. Right now, we've got three different lines of effort across two different major approaches, each one looking for its own silver bullet. And the Army here, it's the most notable because they, as we wrap up FY21 right now, they're spending $832 million on hypersonic development. That isn't just 6% of all of Army R&D. That's 2.2% of the entire Army investment account. That's a, And that takes away from all, not just their other long-range fires priorities, but all of Army modernization. And they have a third of the amount of money to do that with. And when you start looking at this at scale, the Army spent $1.5 billion on long-range hypersonics, a weapon. The Air Force is spending $1.1 on Aero alone in unclassified budgets. The Navy, $2.65 billion since 2019, including $1.37 this year. That's the part that's getting lost in this is how much the Navy's making this a priority because it slides so well into their doctrine because where it's really just swapping out SSGNs for Virginia classes. But even for them, that's going to be a lot of trade-offs. The entire US Navy weapons budget right now for procurement is $4 billion. And they're currently planning for the industrial base to build 24 of these a year. And if these cost 40 to 50 million, which are what we're seeing out of the test shots in the budget, that's 25% of the budget if you don't carry over the R&D money. And a quarter of the budget's already dedicated to Trident. And that money coming, out of, coming over from R&D isn't guaranteed because the whole Navy investment budget is getting eaten alive by nuclear fleet recapitalization. Cost overruns on Columbia, Ford, and Nimitz were so bad last year, this year, that that was the real impetus around all these budget games we saw with the DDG-51. If you go in and add up 650 for Columbia, 308 for Ford, 482 for Nimitz, that's the marginal cost of that second uh, DDG-51 we saw that has gotten so much play in Congress. Air Force, it's the same story. Yes, the missile's gonna be cheaper at maybe 5 million if you believe what they say, but their missiles budget is smaller. They've only got 2.5 billion and they have GBSD and B-21 to think about. And then there's the Army where we don't quite really know, is this a core level commander strike weapon? Is this a deterrence asset where they're sitting on it and it's basically Pershing three? Um, because if you go and build out a battery of these, of six of them with two launchers, that's the equivalent of buying 360 PRISM missiles in a given year. And that's the equivalent, that gives a prism for every single HIMARS in the fleet right now. That is a lot of fires that we are trading off against if we pursue this at scale. And then this is one that I wish our colleague Ashley had been able to make it, um, where we talk about density and where we can put these, of where can we saturate these to get enough fires potential, where it's a day one target, but there's a high payoff for us to have that in that area. I can come up with some kind of crazy scenarios for that, but otherwise we're spending a lot of money for single shot use shots on day one. And I've had a whole number spiel prepared, so I'm happy to turn over to Greg and Mark. Greg or Mark, either of you want to chime in on that? The, the redundancy of the army effort, true or false? Yeah, I, I mean, look, I. I'm a big advocate of the United States, the U.S. military moving more in a direction towards a, a embracing embracing this missile era and becoming more of a missile force. Um, I like the moves the Army is making. Um, I I I understand the Air Force's you know uh, parochial interest and 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 their desire to 
kind of maintain a hold over long range strike, but look at it from the adversary's perspective and, and how, uh, you know, how land-based strike could complicate very much the, the PLA targeting. Um, and we also have to think of a European theater. I mean, we, the, the, you know, the army is the, is the, is the lead in a, in a, in a Yukon scenario and you know, long range strike is going to be very applicable there. Uh, ground-based fires, obviously. Um, so I, look, I, this is such a familiar argument, um, and we just see it over and over again. And especially at any time, any time there's any any hint of a rules and missions debate, or any any time we see you know budgets flatten or t- tend to um, tend towards the kind of the downside. Um, but I just think, look, that we we've gone all in on a platform centric means of of of, um, of delivering long range fires. Um, that assumes that those platforms will be able to get within launch range of their of their munitions. Um, I'm not sure we can make those assumptions going forward uh, indefinitely, certainly not. Um, so the more that we can perhaps disperse uh, our you know our long range fires assets, the more we can put them in in, in, in dispersed locations and in, in, in uh, you know where, inside the WES. Um, the better. So, uh, look, I, I, I'm, I'm wholeheartedly behind the, the what the army is doing currently. Thanks, Greg. Paul, um, yeah, Paul. I'll simply go ahead, jump in and say I'm going to be the cold water on both my colleagues here and say this is all fantastic. But you know, as a former wannabe State Department hobbyist. Um, where are you going to put, especially the ground-based systems, uh, which again, our colleague Ashley, it's, it, um, I know that was something that um, she had highlighted among some internal conversations, um, is not, it's, you can't hand wave that away, um, despite, I would argue, probably some in the Department of Defense who kind of say, well, well, you know, Palawan, of course, is, tends to be the obvious uh, unclassified example in some other places. All awesome. But I would even argue the Tokyos and Canberras of the world are going to have a a lot of hard questions about these systems running around in their territory um, as much as maybe folks on the edges. Um, and so if you are serious about putting Army long range systems, um, which I agree with Greg at a tactical operational level, absolutely, the more you can put these in there and really tuck them and run them around, fantastic. But that doesn't happen in a year or six months of diplomatic efforts. That takes years of diplomatic, hard diplomatic work with a lot of caveats in place, likely from some of these um, powers. So the DOD wants to kind of just say, well, that's somebody else's problem. But the reality is that will become an operational constraint if they do not work hand in hand with the State Department. Yeah, let me, let me I just add, Paul, um, you know, there's been quite a bit of discussion about, uh, you know, how do we, how do we even put small packages of say F-35s forward in, you know, various, Various areas inside, uh, you know, inside in the in the Western Pacific. Um, yet, it, you know that that discussion continues. Yet, it, it, everybody says, well, you know, it's much harder to put in you know, a, a, a land-based missile system. I, I, I don't I don't see how that uh, that squares. Um, you know, the, the logistical challenges of putting in you know a, a missile battery versus supporting uh, you know uh, constant F thirty you know tactical air um, strikes uh, from distributed basing, uh, it, it, you know, it, it's it's just such an order of magnitude more challenging. Yeah, um, I want to hit on one of the points you made, Greg, um, and follow up about so so a lot of times when we talk when we talk long range strike, it's the it's the A two AD fight in the Pacific, right? At the extreme ranges of of um, extreme extreme envelope um, ranges both for the basing, but also for sort of the operational aspect of this. How does this long range fire discussion play in a Korea scenario, in a European scenario, where the ranges are much more constrained than say the Western Pacific? I mean, and I think in a year, so in a European scenario, I think, um, you know, you obviously you're not talking standoff, but you are, like you need some some way of countering what Russia brings to the table in terms of, of artillery and surface to surface missile missile fire because they can saturate 
the battlefield with their organic fires and they could move any defender out of the area just by by, by continuing to march those fires along right um, so you have to provide uh, the joint force the, the ground forces some kind of some kind of means of countering them, some kind of means of taking away those those you know those surface ballistic missile batteries uh, you know they're the, the, the Russian very long range artillery systems and, and you know we currently don't have that so um, you know that's a, absolutely essential to, to to be able to you know to hit hit where they're massing I mean this that was as we know that was such a big part of Bear Land battle back in the 1980s um, you know be able to hit hit the forces as they're uh, you know assembling ready to before they can generate momentum and steamroll over your your, your, your thinly arrayed defenses along the battle zone. So um, again, I think it's, you know, it's, it's extremely applicable in, in, in both scenarios. Thanks for that, Greg. Um, so what I want to do is go to audience questions. Um, and I appreciate the moderator uh, helping me out here with sending me these questions. Apologize. I'm going to, I'm going to, this is kind of a lengthy one. I'm just going to read it. Uh, in this discussion, it seems as if long range strike is defined exclusively as the use of standoff weapons. It seems to define long range penetrating aircraft as something other than long range strike. Why is that? Shouldn't both standoff weapons and long range penetrating aircraft be part of a conversation on long range strike? Who wants to take that one? I mean, I, so I would just say to, I mean, just to kick it off. Um, I mean, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It should entail both. Um, again, uh, you, you know, you, you're dealing with limited numbers of penetrating aircraft, um, and how? So, so look in, the, in an area like the Western Pacific, you're talking basically bombers, because the big challenge with you know fifth gen fighters um, up inside the in the WES is is not you know not necessarily targeting the fighter, the, even the bases or the or the, the fighters themselves. It's the tanker support they re, they require to to perform you know strikes to get to get towards the, the the target itself so those you know where do those where do those big tankers where are they based out of um so you know you're now you're so now you're talking about launching bombers from from you know australia perhaps or you know far you know, continental united states um so it's uh I, again I, I i'm all for going going as fast as we can towards it being becoming more of a missile force. I, I would echo what Greg said and say that uh, I would love, I actually, I would love a, a strong penetrating bomber option um, because as a, again, from the command control perspective, if I've got a human a little bit closer in the loop, closer to the target area and for, and it got obvious, right? If a hypersonic missile or whatever is coming out of the belly of that aircraft can get there that much faster. Fantastic. That would be awesome. But like Greg, I'm a little skeptical of how it gets from A to B. And to again, to be completely blunt, like especially if we're talking penetrating bomber and we're talking something, of course, a la B-21, those are not cheap. Um, and so, you know, in a fight of the scale that we think might happen in the Asia Pacific, are you going to really dedicate what's going to probably wind up being a pretty limited number of B-21s to go in against anything other than a, the most high value of high value targets? I think that becomes the challenge. And again, especially if they're going to take the risk to get in there. Um, and if you believe that they will get in there undetected. All right. Yeah. And I think I go off Mark's point here of, I think one, we have to think about these as just a whole systems of delivering fires of it's a delivery platform. But I think going off of Mark's point on detection, there's a question of, at how close can you get before you have true, uh, before you have to turn around? When is that last point of launch? Because I think we forget at a certain stage, not, yes, our adversaries have put a lot more money into making advanced investments on a lot of, to counter stealth, but also they rely on a lot greater density of their air defense networks than we traditionally have thought of. And so at a certain point, you have to assume that these will get detected and that this you aren't going to be able for just be setting a few miles off. You're going to have to be launching from extremer ranges 
but whatever degree you're able to get closer does provide a major return on investment. And I think that's one of the big reasons why B-21 is a priority because you can be fighting from inside the enemy's strategic depth versus from your own. Thanks, Hamilton. Uh, another question um, hitting on the detection point. So to Mark's comments on where to put long range fires, can you address the ability of launchers to quote, hide in plain sight in countries like Indonesia and Philippines and in an era of smartphone slash connectivity? Mark? I'm, I'm smiling because uh, I, the open source intelligence that just continues to grow in stature and um, usefulness to the intelligence community, to defense planners, that kind of stuff, it just continues to grow. Um, you know, it's, it's, there was, as a total side note, there was a story about where the Brits are starting to have some struggles with uh, recruiting for submarines because the next generation is like, well, what do you mean I can't take my smartphone on a submarine? I'm like, well, you take it, but, you know, shockingly, there's no signal underneath the water there. So, you know, it, it, it's absolutely a great, great question of, and if you do believe, uh, and rightfully so, we would do the same thing if the roles were reversed. If you believe, of course, that there's Chinese infiltration and penetration for human intelligence and, of course, open source intelligence and data fusion, it's a great question. Um, with that being said, though, sometimes it's not about where the unit is or, or where the unit was. It's where the unit's going, right? So depending on your tactics and techniques, and to be in full disclosure, I was a former Navy bu Bubba, so I will defer to anyone on the line who is of an army, you know, artillery style to totally correct what I'm about to say. I assume with tactics and techniques, you know, maybe detection is somewhat inevitable. Certainly, I think at the moment of fire, it's going to be pretty obvious where that initial shot is coming from. But all the more reason why there's shoot and scoot techniques and procedures in the army and in other, you know, the Marine Corps being another one. Um, so the, the key is to, you know, not that you always avoid detection, but just avoid it long enough to pack your stuff up and move even, you know, 10 miles down the road. Thanks, Mark. Let's go to another question real quick. Um, what should we do or how should we adapt if we can't gain parity with some of these Chinese or Russian systems, particularly in hypersonics? Gregor Hamilton. Yeah. Um, look, I, it, I, I don't think we, it, we should look at it as terms of, in terms of a hypersonics arms race and we, we either, you know, win or lose. And it's all, it's all in on this one weapon system, you know, um, as we know, there's there's lots of links in a in a in a chain, a kill chain that have to be connected to to, to realize you know an actual strike on target. Um, those our kill chains are vulnerable. Our adversary kill chains are also vulnerable. So um, we it's not it's not that we don't have any means of addressing uh, the hypersonic threat. Um, and it's just it's look it's one of those it's a it's a weapon system that. We need to learn to fight through. Um, it will require changes in our basing, the way we operate, uh, you know, on the surface of the ocean, um, that the logistics throughputs in theater. I mean, it it goes back to. I tell people it goes back to. I look at it at kind of the the Cold War era, where. You know, we knew that we were going to operate that NATO was going to operate under sustained missile strikes from Soviet territory. But they planned for that, they accounted for it, and they adjusted their concepts of operation accordingly. It wasn't that they threw up their hands and said, wow, this is, you know, this is a weapon that we can't, there's nothing we can do about it. It's, they developed means to, 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 to work around it, developed, developed our turn, alternative concepts of operation, and that's exactly what we need to do in this case. Hamilton, you're on mute. The classic 2021. Um, but I would go off of what Greg said in two things. One, yes, we've been here before, and we've also seen how people have reacted to us, so we can change our doctrine from those lessons learned. We forget Russian artillery during the Cold War outranged us. If you go read the after-action reports from the Gulf War, we had to adopt scoot and shoot inside enemy fire envelopes because they outranged us by 20%, 30%. Um, and so these are tactics that are out there that we can address. And we've seen people use against us in many of these locations. I think the other one is 
we need to look make sure that we keep up the in tempo and strength of S&T investment so that we aren't caught aware in the next iteration. So that not just we can possibly reverse that curve or counter those the current wave, but also be ready for whatever the next thing is. The bomber gap led to the missile gap, which led to tank gaps. Um, you, these things move in cycles, and we need to make sure that we're still investing, even though it's not the prettiest thing in a lot of different S&T technologies, like directed energy or non-hypersonic advanced strike weapons, or even on that, the material science that makes so much of this work that underline all of these investments that often take decades to actually play out. Yeah, and, and again, going back to the, to, to, like Hamilton said, the concepts, you know, a big get off the X, as we used to say, you know, uh, a hypersonic weapon, and it's most effective against a static target. So stay mobile. Uh, you know, that's a, it's a little adage, of, you know, from World War II Navy Pacific days, you know, if you're not mobile, you're useless. So, you know, we have to stay mobile and agile. Although I hate the word agile. Thanks, Greg. Uh, so I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, uh, next question. In the Cold War, these systems would have likely been nuclear systems or have a nuclear variant. What are the planned payloads for U.S. and foreign hypersonic systems? Well, we certainly hope not nuclear. <laughs> uh, uh, Hamilton, yeah. you talked earlier about, you know, some of these are going to be kinetic, some of these are going to be... Yeah, um, I can say that's one where I think there's a lot of gray area here and it's hard to give a good answer because one, we're still defining these systems, but also they're really some very complicated arms control questions when you get into this, where it might actually be better in some cases to choose to go non-nuclear on these because of the threat of escalation. Um, I mentioned this in some of my early comments, but the one that comes to mind is the sheer amount of panic that anybody has if a submarine launched missile comes out of the water a few 50 miles from your coast. Um, that, not to play out Hunt for Red October scenarios, but those are the very much the nightmare scenarios of the Cold War. That was what the Cuban Missile Crisis was about. And I think everybody starts acting very differently around these systems if they start becoming day zero nuclear strike weapons and they end up playing the political ramifications are probably not something that can be wrestled with in a panel that has about four or five minutes left. Yeah, yeah Paul, then, I'll jump in as a sensor guy and say that the other challenge with hypersonics is if you do believe that there's going to be dual use um, some of how we calculate and do calculations on nuclear planning, nuclear warning is based on ballistic missile trajectories um, and how you're going to account for a system that may start ballistic but may not end ballistic um, and, and how, what your threshold for risk is as a senior decision maker is something that I think definitely worth the conversation of course behind, you know, doors with sound pucks and stuff. But it's, it's going to need to happen because the presentation to senior leaders and a timeline, right? The compressed uh, timeline is going to be really challenging if, if, if it is a nuclear warhead, which we'll see. And going off Mark's point on that, on the sensor side, like I suddenly just recalled when 1984, a false reading that you came within one man's decision making of, do you start the nuclear launch process because of a false sensor reading? And what is happens when we're talking a five to 10 minute window. Yeah, totally. and, 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 and a, point I, I, a point I tried to make into my opening uh, comments, it's, you know, our, our target list is very different for uh, a, a hypersonic type weapon than, say, a, a China, Chinese target list. Um, and so, we, you know, again, we need to answer the question of how many, how many homeland strikes will a nuclear armed adversary tolerate? before they begin to signal or demonstrate as escalation. So, um, and, and, you know, we need to have that same debate. How many are we willing to accept? Um, 
before we start signaling, look, this is you know the, the, the next one that comes, and we're gonna we're gonna respond with a, a different kind of one altogether. Great. Well, I know we could go on uh, for much longer, uh, and you know, ideally this would be over a over drink, but. Uh, I want to be cognizant of everybody's time, um, and I appreciate everyone attending. I appreciate uh, the the MITRE team, the Jane's team for a for a robust discussion. Uh, I ap appreciate the uh, the moderators uh, back behind the scenes helping us put this together. Uh, we have about two minutes left, so as we close out, any rapid fire last minute closing comments from from the panel, Mark, Greg, or or Hamilton. Yeah. Let me let me just say I, I, I see us venturing down this hypersonics path, and like I said at the outset, I think there are there is certainly utility, um, specifically going after fleeting targets. Um, however, I have you know we've all heard senior leaders in the department talking about oh we're going to build up a space-based defense layer for to, to counter hypersonics. I mean now you're now you're talking just you know ridiculous and fantasy amounts of you know resources. So. I, I just worry about uh, you know where this could potentially lead the department in terms of, of spending. I'll piggyback off that and say the cost per effect, $40 million, as Hamilton alluded to, per missile, I'm really wrapping my head around that's a heck of a lot of cash for one thing to do one thing and never to come back and do that same thing again. Um, and so how we are squaring that uh, it becomes a challenge and, and not lose the war because we get run out of money or because we don't have enough of these things. Yeah, uh, I had a couple of things that if this panel had gone another hour, I would have loved to talk about. Um, I'm pretty sure I wanted to pick Mark's brain about just how amount when we start talking about these sensors that we have to generate, the sheer amount of onboard processing that we're going to need at all levels of that C2 chain in order to just be able to communicate within these denied environments. Um, there's, of course, a discussion also around those space-based sensor layers. And the one I really feel sad I didn't get to was, as we got stuck on hypersonics, when we talk about on the ground changing technologies, I think we still somewhat underrate the Army's extended range cannon artillery program and the forthcoming Army fires infrastructure that we're going to see increase the rocket force by itself by 50% over the next five years. Because we've been operating in an environment where the Russian at a brigade level outgun us three to one and are much more emphasis on rapid fire, where when we start moving into having 70 kilometer ranges on these instead of the Russians being able to do 30 to 40, that is a severe level of overmatch that will change how we end up not only just conducting our maneuver by fire or fire and maneuver, but altering how the Russians think about their own fire and maneuver by fire approach. Great. Well, thanks, everybody. I know we're at time. Uh, I appreciate the discussion. I appreciate the questions. I apologize if we didn't get to all of them. But uh, as Hamilton said, we could have gone on for, for many more hours. But uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. I uh, hope you have a good rest of your day. Joining us today. I uh, hope you have a good rest of your day.